form or place. 4. While philosophers disagree irreconcilably on these points, their conclusions cannot be considered as undoubtedly true. Since absolute knowledge was considered unattainable, the skeptics declared the end of their discipline to be an opinionatives, a disturbance, an impulsives, moderation, and in disquietives, suspension. The sect of the Stoics was founded by Zeno 340-265 BC, the Satian, who studied under Crates the Cynic, from which sect the Stoics had their origin. Zeno was succeeded by Cleans, Chrysippus, Zeno of Tarsus, Diogenes, Antipater, Panius, and Posidonius. Most famous of the Roman Stoics are Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. The Stoics were essentially pantheists, since they maintained that as there is nothing better than the world, the world is God. Zeno declared that the reason of the world is diffused throughout it as seed. Stoicism is a materialistic philosophy, enjoining voluntary resignation to natural law. Chrysippus maintained that good and evil being contrary, both are necessary since each sustains the other. The soul was regarded as a body distributed throughout the physical form and subject to dissolution with it. Though some of the Stoics held that wisdom prolonged the existence of the soul, actual immortality is not included in their tenets. The soul was said to be composed of eight parts the five senses, the generative power, the vocal power, and an eighth, or hegemonic, part. Nature was defined as God mixed throughout the substance of the world. All things were looked upon as bodies either corporeal or incorporeal. Meekness marked the attitude of the Stoic philosopher. While Diogenes was delivering a discourse against anger, one of his listeners spat contemptuously in his face. Receiving the insult with humility, the great Stoic was moved to retort I am not angry, but am in doubt whether I ought to be so or not. Epicurus of Samos 341-270 BC was the founder of the Epicurean sect, which in many respects resembles the Cyrenaic but is higher in its ethical standards. The Epicureans also posited pleasure as the most desirable state, but conceived it to be a grave and dignified state achieved through renunciation of those mental and emotional inconstancies which are productive of pain and sorrow. Epicurus held that as the pains of the mind and soul are more grievous than those of the body, so the joys of the mind and soul exceed those of the body. The Cyrenaics asserted pleasure to be dependent upon action or motion. The Epicureans claim rest or lack of action to be equally productive of pleasure. Epicurus accepted the philosophy of Democritus concerning the nature of atoms and based his physics upon this theory. The Epicurean philosophy may be summed up in four canons one sense is never deceived. And therefore every sensation and every perception of an appearance is true. Two opinion follows upon sense and is superior to sensation, and capable of truth or falsehood. Three all opinion attested, or not contradicted by the evidence of sense, is true. Four an opinion contradicted, or not attested by the evidence of sense, is false. Among the Epicureans of note were Metrodorus of Lamsicus, Zeno of Sidon, and P. H. Rus. Eclecticism may be defined as the practice of choosing apparently irreconcilable doctrines from antagonistic schools and constructing therefrom a composite philosophic system in harmony with the convictions of the eclectic himself. Eclecticism can scarcely be considered philosophically or logically sound, for as individual schools arrive at their conclusions by different methods of reasoning, so the philosophic product of fragments from these schools must necessarily be built upon the foundation of conflicting premises. Eclecticism, accordingly, has been designated the layman's cult. In the Roman Empire little thought was devoted to philosophic theory. Consequently most of its thinkers were of the eclectic type. Cicero is the outstanding example of early eclecticism, for his writings are a veritable potpourri of invaluable fragments from earlier schools of thought. Eclecticism appears to have had its inception at the moment when men first doubted the possibility of discovering ultimate truth. Observing all so-called knowledge to be mere opinion at best, the less studious furthermore concluded that the wiser course to pursue was to accept that which appeared to be the most reasonable of the teachings of any school or individual. From this practice, however, arose a pseudo-broad-mindedness devoid of the element of preciseness found in true logic and philosophy. The Neo-Pythagorean school flourished in Alexandria during the first century of the Christian era. 
only two names stand out in connection with it, Apollonius of Tana and Moderatus of Gades. Neopythagoreanism is a link between the older pagan philosophies and Neoplatonism. Like the former, it contained many exact elements of thought derived from Pythagoras and Plato. Like the latter, it emphasized metaphysical speculation and ascetic habits. A striking similarity has been observed by several authors between Neopythagoreanism and the doctrines of the Essenes. Special emphasis was laid upon the mystery of numbers, and it is possible that the Neopythagoreans had a far wider knowledge of the true teachings of Pythagoras than is available today. Even in the first century Pythagoras was regarded more as a god than a man, and the revival of his philosophy was resorted to apparently in the hope that his name would stimulate interest in the deeper systems of learning. But Greek philosophy had passed the zenith of its splendor. The mass of humanity was awakening to the importance of physical life and physical phenomena. The emphasis upon earthly affairs which began to assert itself later reached maturity of expression in 20th century materialism and commercialism, even though Neoplatonism was to intervene and many centuries passed before this emphasis took definite form. Insert From Virgil's Ide Dryden's Translation Virgil describes part of the ritual of a Greek mystery, possibly the Eleusinian, and his account of the descent of Ys, to the gate of hell under the guidance of the Sibyl. Of that part of the ritual portrayed above the immortal poet writes full in the midst of this infernal road, an elm displays her dusky arms abroad. The god of sleep there hides his heavy head and empty dreams on every leaf are spread. Of various forms, unnumbered spectres more. Centaurs, in double shapes, besiege the door before the passage horrid Hydra stands, and Briarius with all his hundred hands gorgons, Jurian with his triple frame and vain shimmer vomits empty flame. The chief unsheath of his shining steel, preppered, though seized with sudden fear, to force the guard. Offering his brandished weapon at their face, had not the Sibyl stopped at his eager pace, and told him what those empty phantoms were. Forms without bodies, and impassive air. Continued. Although Ammonius Saccus was long believed to be the founder of Neoplatonism, the school had its true beginning in Plotinus AD 204-269. Prominent among the Neoplatonists of Alexandria, Syria, Rome, and Athens were Porphyry, Iamblichus, Celestius, the Emperor Julian, Plutarch, and Proclus. Neoplatonism was the supreme effort of decadent pagandum to publish and thus preserve for posterity its secret or unwritten doctrine. In its teachings ancient idealism found its most perfect expression. Neoplatonism was concerned almost exclusively with the problems of higher metaphysics. It recognized the existence of a secret and all-important doctrine which from the time of the earliest civilizations had been concealed within the rituals, symbols, and allegories of religions and philosophies. To the mind unacquainted with its fundamental tenets, Neoplatonism may appear to be a mass of speculations interspersed with extravagant flights of fancy. Such a viewpoint, however, ignores the institutions of the mysteries, those secret schools into whose profundities of idealism nearly all of the first philosophers of antiquity were initiated. When the physical body of pagan thought collapsed, an attempt was made to resurrect the form by instilling new life into it by the unveiling of its mystical truths. This effort apparently was barren of results. Despite the antagonism, however, between pristine Christianity and Neoplatonism many basic tenets of the latter were accepted by the former and woven into the fabric of patristic philosophy. Briefly described, Neoplatonism is a philosophic code which conceives every physical or concrete body of doctrine to be merely the shell of a spiritual verity which may be discovered through meditation and certain exercises of a mystic nature. In comparison to the esoteric spiritual truths which they contain, the corporeal bodies of religion and philosophy were considered relatively of little value. Likewise, no emphasis was placed upon the material sciences. The term patristic is employed to designate the philosophy of the fathers of the early Christian church. Patristic philosophy is divided into two general epochs Anninocene and post -Nicene. The Anninocene period in the main was devoted to attacks upon paganism and to apologies and defenses of Christianity. The entire structure of pagan philosophy was assailed in the dictates of faith elevated above those of reason. 
In some instances efforts were made to reconcile the evident truth of paganism with Christian revelation. Eminent among the 